Hey, and welcome to The Residence, a series of four podcasts exploring community in the creative sector, specifically focusing on the Pervasive Media Studio, a brilliant community of over 160 artists, creative companies, technologists, and academics, all exploring experience design and creative tech in and around Bristol. The Pervasive Media Studio is a collaboration between The Watershed, University of Bristol, and UE Bristol. We've all kindly decided to support this podcast, so shouts to them. For this series, we invited residents who you might consider to be people of difference to chat with us on Zoom about how they were coping with lockdown. But we've also thrown some moral dilemmas or quandaries their way, if you will, so stay tuned. In this episode, we're joined by residents who identify as disabled, exploring what the adjustments into lockdown did for them and their work. And we had a punt at defining community in a world that's even more reliant on digital interactions. Hey guys, you're tuned into The Residence and my name is Will Taylor and I am joined here by Raquel, Johnny and Grace who are all residents in the PM studio Uh, and yeah this episode has been a long time in the making and we are so, I can say for myself and for Joe most definitely, we are so happy to be in the space and having this conversation with you guys man and just checking in about life in lockdown as creatives you know uh life in lockdown as people who work in the culture sector who identify as disabled and everything that has come with that in this context it's been a weird 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 period of time and with that everyone is facing uh like broad spectrum of challenges if you know what I mean um and with that there's been so much learning but one of the big things for me uh over this period of time has been the importance of like community and actually making space to to take a step back and actively listen to the way that the pandemic has really affected everybody you get me uh so with no further ado I'd like you guys to introduce yourselves. I'm gonna ask Raquel to pick a number from one to three. Uh, two. Two, uh, self-nominated. If you could. <laughs> Thought I was being safe by going in the middle. <laughs> it's the easiest way to kind of like, like nominate someone I found on Zoom, if you just randomize it from numbers. So yeah, if you, if you wanna introduce yourself for our listeners, that'd be amazing. Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, my name is Raquel Nisagir. I'm a disabled artist. I work in dance and theater and um, live art a little bit in that the pieces that I make are sometimes installations, sometimes provocation, sometimes dance theater shows. Um, And I founded a, a company called Uncharted Collective in 2016 specifically to explore the, the um, experience of uh, uh, disability like chronic pain and to make kind of theatrical encounters that explore that with an audience. Amazing, thank you, thank you. Um, we have Grace. Grace, if you'd like to introduce yourself. So, hi. I'm Grace Quantock. I am a psychotherapeutic counsellor and I specialise in working with people with multiple marginalised and oppressed identities and a fellow and researcher in data and I'm also an executive director across uh, health, social care and health and health human rights and I'm a founder of postcardfromthemargins.com <coughs> where we are sending missives of support and resources. And Lastly, we have Johnny, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Uh, hi there. Um, I don't know if I can even go that, but um, <laughs> I, I, I'll try my best. Um, so I'm Johnny Cotton. Um, I'm based in Cardiff in Wales. Um, I am... Um, uh, this is a bit I really hate so much because people ask me what I do, but I do so much. I do a lot of things, and I hope in five years' time I'll be able to pick a skill set 
that I'm really good at. So this is really very much part of the journey. This is what I'm doing. So I was um, an, an art teacher, qualified art teacher, um, working at faculty level, and um, I quit my teaching to uh, after the response of lack of uh, deaf artists in Wales and the lack of art that uh, we have in Wales. So I'm a profoundly deaf man. Um, so I, I primarily work at um, an art that consultant with a focus on deaf audience. Um, um, I also, um, which I really love doing, um, but it's very much uh, for me uh, a kicker in one year out of the other year. So um, a little bit of a token thing in there, but I thought then actually then why not become a performer? So I became a performer to to um, to sort of tell my life story, um, a little bit about life experience, and to. Um, uh, I really believe in activism, so I, I use a lot of activism in my performance work. Um, I believe in social change, I believe in social impact. Um, so I very much, I'm not a vocal person, but I do this in very much creatively through my work. Um, so, um, yeah, facilitate, I do keynote speaking, uh, produce, I write. Do a lot of other things, which is why I find it quite difficult. Um, but mainly, I work as an act that consultant. Um, but then becoming on a resident with pervaded media studio, I'm looking at uh, interweaving technology with um, act that. So that may in a short version, I hope. Thank you, and I love that. Actually, I think that's that's actually really important, and I'd like to speak to that uh, thing of. As residents of the PM studio, actually, like there's so many random, uh, like varied lived experiences, uh, like all converging on this one space. But then in order to like communicate or best communicate your aspirations or refine like your intentions into something that's like achievable and deliverable, we have to do this thing of like, putting ourselves in a box, it kind of works against intersectionality, you know what I mean? And that's something I've discovered more and more as I explore social impact in the work that I do. I was wondering, like, is there a pushback? And if so, like, how do you embody or practice the pushback to labels in practice? Will, do you mean sort of in culture at large or in the culture of the PM studio? In culture at large, you know, I see the PM studio as something that's like a, as a broadcaster, like it mm. kind of brings people in so they can get the work done and then it broadcasts it out because so much social impact is there. I think, I mean, I think Johnny already spoke, you know, so powerfully to this about, you know, the labelling and the tokenism. And um, I felt that, while there is some appetite for um, people to speak from lived experience, it, in my experience, can be um, another form of marginalisation because you're only asked in to speak about your lived experience related to your horrible phrase, protected characteristic. Because so, because um, so. And, you know, for me, it has felt in times like an updated version of the freak show where kind of like I am wheeled in and, you know, displayed and asked to tell of traumatic experiences for other people's education and benefit. And, you know, I'm running a writing workshop um, in the next couple of months where we're talking about um, a line from the Adrian Riche poem about how not to make a career out of your pain, avoiding the temptation to, of making a career from your pain. Because if that's all you get paid for, then how would you not do it? And at the same time, it, I'm not somebody who in any way would say, um, uh, I'm, disability doesn't matter or it's not who I am, um, because that's just simply not true in that you know, is, there's a whole other load of stuff there. But at the same time, it makes me think, I read recently, I think that um, somebody said to Serena Williams, you must be one of the greatest female athletes of all time. She said, I think I'd prefer to be one of the greatest athletes of all time. I caught that qualifier. Like I noticed that. Um, 
and so I guess I'm with you know how do we create art or at least I think to myself how do I create art and writing which is from my experience and is framed by it and shaped by it and what is a disabled essay what is an, an experience arising from that but um, it's still able to be received by non-disabled audiences that's the kind of stuff we were talking about when I first met you but then obviously 2020 has thrown this massive massive bag of lemons in, in, in the pot and we're now trying to respond to that like how how have you guys like Raquel how have you found like working in the context of a pandemic where contact and communication uh, and certain elements of cultural work have been forced to take to reside in different spaces and in different ways to what we're used to mm. Um, it's yeah it's been quite a journey so I remember at the beginning of lockdown uh, among colleagues in the disabled community we didn't quite understand this sense of oh no how am I going to survive without going outside for for a few weeks or a few months um, because it it for a lot of us we spend a lot of time at home and for a lot of us our, our worlds are a, a small, a small geographical area. Often, not always, um, and there was also a kind of euphoria, I guess, at the beginning that so many things went online so quickly. There was a kind of, maybe euphoria isn't the right word, but a, a lot of colleagues um, talked about theatre being more accessible to them now than it ever had been, and saying things like. I, I go to the Royal Opera House now, not that they go physically, but that they online go to the, to the Royal Opera House. Um, but I suppose that there was also a, it was bittersweet because for lots of people that had been asking for that for a long time, for it to have been seen as um, impossible and then very quickly when everybody needed it, it's totally possible uh, it's not even hard that yeah that was that felt bittersweet so it, and I think but, but as the experiment has gone on if you like of this with kind of putting live work online I feel like for lots of us it didn't quite it didn't really sustain so maybe for about six weeks I'd say I was really interested in watching stuff online and watching, watching the NT lives and things like that. And after that, that interest tapered off. And it was interesting talking to a lot of other um, uh, directors of theatres saying that, yeah, actually, uh, over time, we, we missed the theatre and we missed the live experience. And although the, the screen and the online offerings are important, and they definitely shouldn't vanish when we can go back into theatres because it's been a really really important um thing for lots of people M a lot of us want to be back in the theatre and it's quite it's quite interesting in a way because i feel like there has been pressure on the theatre industry to digitalize before this and this has kind of been a little experiment to, to see whether it would sustain interest and I don't think it it does I don't I think the live certainly a lot of the people I'm speaking to were really missing the liveness of being together that's not to say that this format doesn't have like amazing affordances if you like like I just did today a um some research with some colleagues around um chronic pain and dance and it it was amazing to do that in our own homes because often we're, we're really good at taking care of ourselves when we're in the studio doing work um, and it's really, really held and we're less good at taking care of ourselves in kind of normal day-to-day -day life. So then to do that research while we were in our own homes felt like it integrated it. So th there's, there's great things about this and, and it, it, it's like anything, isn't it? It's using it when it, when it really fits what you're trying to do but um but yeah miss the theater really miss the theater i can i can definitely um understand and and like 
really get how that sort of like physical element of the theatre and real time in life space and the what's the word I'm thinking of like randomness how like no show is ever the same as the last is there a word for that in theatre mm, is, is there a word for that Johnny I, I'd, I'd just call it the, the liveness just the possibility yeah. that anything can happen and anything can go wrong yeah I love that. I love really, that. theater, theater. I don't, I don't know the term or <laughs> kind of thing. I get, yeah, live, live, lived experience, yeah, that kind of thing. But yeah, you're acting the wrong person. Maybe I'm <laughs> <laughs> in the old thing. I think I'm totally asking the right person. <laughs> <Not me. laughs> so, like, like Johnny, like you, you pretty much like do it all. I think with social impact being like a fundamental aspect of the work that you do, it takes you into, into so many different spaces. Like, has the variety of your work increased since, because of lockdown? Do you find yourself in new spaces yet again? Or has, have you found it sort of like converged to a real like core, core element of practice? Um, really interesting, yeah. Um, first of all, I want to say it is great to be in a space with great and um, Raquel. Uh, there's something very, um, being in a room with the David Arthur, it's almost like a sense of relief, almost, and uh, the tension, the threat comes right down, and uh, you've got a sense of welcoming and a safe space. And I believe in having a safe space, uh, and it's really important. And uh, you find that kind of connection, and uh, that kind of reflected a lot with the work I do. You know, it's finding that safe space, and it's really important because we're tired, you know, we're tired of, uh, you know, uh, I need a lip read. Uh, and that's the biggest problem for me in lockdown <laughs> because everyone's got this mat, and, um, and uh, it's not so much um, I'm telling them that. Kind can you, uh, you know, um, can you make it easy for me? It's me saying that I'm deaf. That's the biggest problem for me. Like I'm saying, I'm constantly saying, why do I have to keep saying it? I'm deaf. Uh, you know, I'm deaf. I can't read the lip. You know, that be mentally tiring for me. You know, and uh, what is the solution? I can't tell people to take their mat off for lots of reasons. Uh, but you know, and um, so. So I thought a lot about um, mental health and art, well-being, and uh, so I've got quite involved with um, to uh, think about um, uh, research around mental health and art and how we could bring those two together. And in a way, I kind of moved away from performing. I moved away from, uh, I guess, technology, uh, all of that kind of stuff. And um, I want to think about myself. And uh, so I did, I, I've been kind of doing more creative practice and um, and I've just really enjoyed it. I've just really um, enjoyed talking to the Deb of Death and the Deb of Artist a lot. Um, in terms of my own creative practice, um, I've kind of, um, yeah, just kind of, um, doing different things and doing things what's right for me and uh, it's been really good. I do keynote speaking, uh, I speak about uh, all of these things what I'm just saying now. I'm thinking about what my vision and how I see myself in five years. Um, um, but weirdly, last week I, I performed for the first time in uh, seven months uh, in Poland um uh which was uh, a very strange thing because i didn't think it was gonna happen and um while i hated all the uh the communication barrier you know obviously the airport and everything the flight and everything it was absolutely beautiful to be on stage again with people in front of me um, there were some people in there, um, all doted well, sort of doted it with mat, but deaf people were at them for not wearing a mat. And what's so beautiful about it, it's not just for me, but it's for the audience as well to do that kind of connection. And that's what's missing, I think, here. And, uh, and I made me realize this is why I perform. Um, you know, I perform because I know I'm making a difference. I know through my story. Uh, through my performing, uh, I'm making a difference to the audience. And uh, what's lovely about my show 
it worked. Not so much in the UK, but it worked all around the world. So you've got Polish people, deaf Polish people, you don't really know BFL, uh, British Sign Language, are still connected with me because the barriers are there. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and uh, one of the reasons why I perform, because I want to connect. I want to connect with deaf people, not just so much in Wales, but everywhere I go. Um, so in a way, yeah, so we're kind of resetting the button. That's what it is. That's what I'm doing. I'm resetting the button. That's what, if, if a lot of conversations I've had around COVID, like, and lockdown, that's what a lot of people have done. But you might be the first person <laughs> uh, I've heard put it that way. Um, and I appreciate that because I need that. Do you know what I mean? Uh, that conversation really put lockdown into perspective. An everyday life for that matter. Resetting our buttons whilst living through a literal social experiment are just two ways this year has differed so much. In the next part, we find out what our guests would do with a few carte blanche. Hey guys, hope you had a, a nice little break. We're going to get into the little game that the residents like to play. So I'm going to put some categories in the chat. They are arts, tech, economy, health, and social. I'm going to start with Johnny on this one. Let's cover art. Third one in the list. Okay. I love this one. <laughs> uh, for, for some reason, Johnny, you seem to have a spare 100k that you want to spend on an arts project. How would you spend it? 100,000. Um, well, that's an easy one for me. I would open up a art and cultural hub that is led by deaf people for deaf people and bridging the gap between deaf and hearing communities. And within that hub, there would be a deaf cafe and commissioned artwork from local and worldwide tablet artists. Can I come and set up my chronic pain centre next door? Or like in a wing or something. Oh, 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 oh what's that? Another hundred k for you, Raquel. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> no, 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 the hundred thousand for me. <laughs> no, 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 you still get it. You still get it, and I get hundred k as well. Hundred yeah. k yeah. doesn't go that far, you know. But, but it would be a start. Um, I sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. I just wanted to be next door to Johnny. Um, because it, because I've been thinking for so long about wanting to create a centre like somewhere, if where you can go if you develop, if you become disabled, that is such a hard experience to go through on your own if you acquire a disability, and most people I've spoken to who go through that, you know, it strains everything, it strains all relationships, and there is no safe space. It's like you're bounced around medical places um and when i think back to it now probably that is the that is the worst thing that happened about becoming disabled was that those few years spent bouncing from one appointment to another trying to figure out how to get better and actually i only started to live well when i stopped trying to get better but is you know to have a place where you can go that isn't medical that isn't that has no agenda that is heavily influenced by the arts and that is safe where you can get support to go through that journey and and like open up because the most beautiful thing about becoming disabled one of them for me is just opening up to so many different people's lives and how they live and how and that that diversity and being introduced to it in a beautiful way through art and and held like this spaces where you know your whatever you need is not too much trouble it's you know it's fine it's perfect so i want to be next door to johnny and go and hang out in the deaf cafe i'll give you the back neighbor 
Come on, Greg, yeah. come in and that door to her. <laughs> oh, I love this. And actually, pre-pandemic, where I used to see clients, um, I didn't pick to work in like a therapeutic clinic. I worked in an art centre. Mm. So um, the waiting room was a cafe or an art gallery. And I actually did the therapeutic work in an art gallery. So I was literally, so we'd have different exhibitions in and we'd work with what the art was um, within the therapeutic space. It was wonderful. I do really, um, I do miss that. But actually, fascinatingly, Will, I was actually once asked this question for real, not with 100K, but with like a large number, which I can't recall now, something a huge amount. Um, because there was a social investor um, who'd, um, who did a fund and I'd had some funding from them to set up my social enterprise, Healing Boxes. We all got called to this meeting, we didn't know what it was gonna be about. And they went around the table and said to each of us, what would you do with like 80K or something? Um, oh, I'm so bad at the numbers. Like anyway, that. And we all had to go around and say, and like one, one of them was gonna get funded. Wow. And it was, it was a difficult and like, interesting i mean a lot of people i think kind of you know pitch what their kind of project du jour was which i really get um but what my interest was at what point in people's journeys are they most at a threshold where they could go one way or another so where are the thresholds where people are already looking just as like I was saying, for example, with acquired disability, you're through a new threshold. You didn't ask to be there. Something's happening. Your, um, uh, you know, your, your habitual has been disrupted. You could go any of a number of ways. Um, how do we make a, an offer for people there um, where there's something that's sustainable and possible and accessible? Um, because quite often a lot of the offers, at least in that place, are like... Um, you know, a brave sufferer, she never complained, and repression, much, or like, you know, or um, addiction, yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly, mm. or like, you know, you can be kind of super grip, or you can be brave, or you can be, uh, so yeah, it's, um, but I love that question, it's still a fascinating one to me, don't ask me it, again now, please. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I, I won't. I won't. <laughs> once the questions get struck off the list, once they're asked. So you're lucky. You're lucky. Um, who's next? I'm going to I'm going to pick Grace to pick the next category. OK, I may regret this. I'm going to pick health. Hmm. Be kind. I don't want to go too dark. <laughs> I had a lot of dark conversations today. Let's not get too too far down that road. I'm trying. I'm trying to talk about hope today. Like, like don't make it too hard for me. This this is hope and it's and it's playful. You know, like okay. we're we're not we're not holding anyone to like. You don't have to live and die on these hills, as my flatmate so aptly said to me the other night. Um, so this question is. Therapy is now mandatory. Everyone has to have at least four sessions per year. And if they don't, there are large fines. How do you go about implementing this? <laughs> I'd be helping to deconstruct it so that that wasn't the case. Talk to me. This is interesting. Okay. Firstly, like mandatory, mandatory therapy generally doesn't work. Mm. Um, it's, it's not terribly helpful. Like it can do a little bit, but like yeah. you have to do a huge amount of work as a therapist to do that. Um, and like people, people come at the time that they're ready to come. And sometimes people come um, because they really want to do the deep work and they want to go into stuff. But sometimes what they do, because they come and like, for example, they have a lot of abuse or difficulties in their past or trauma they've experienced. And perhaps they've got a grief now and the grief has overwhelmed their coping strategy of constantly being on the move and never thinking about it. Like, and, and they want new coping strategies. Now, you met, like one way to do this would be to actually start to unpick a lot of what happened to them and, and help to kind of, you know, start to understand the frameworks and the trauma and try and repair and try and, you know, put things in place. But not everybody wants to do that. 
some people just want new and better coping strategies, like the equivalent of therapeutically stronger drugs. And that is a choice they're making as adults. And that is okay. And I respect that choice. So if they don't want to do the, 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 the un unpicking, unfolding work, then we don't do that. I can't say I get many people like that. Most people who work with me want to do the deep work. That's why they're working with me. But I have had a few people, especially when I was volunteering pre-pandemic, and who just wanted better coping strategies. So we just did better coping strategies. Um, and then you've got, you know, people who, for example, will um, come in and they'll circle a few times and they're not quite ready to unpick or they'll want to do it so far. And like, you know, sometimes you have people like come and they will say, um, oh, you know, um, I don't know why everybody kind of is mean to me and people laugh at me, for example, and there may be some ableism happening there or some racism uh, that, that they're experiencing. Um, but not everybody is ready to actually look at the world through those frames because that can unfold like, oh, when my family's leaving me behind when they go on holiday, is that actually ableist? Yes. Uh, like actually this can be huge and it can really divorce people from their communities. That level of understanding, um, that's a tough one and it can be incredibly destabilizing and painful. And also um, it's a little bit like with, I don't want to topic here, it's a little bit like with abuse for content warning mention of abuse, no graphic. Um, like when children experience abuse, um, obviously there's different ways of processing it, but often you have a couple of ways to understand it. So the one way is to think, I did something wrong. I made the bad thing happen. So that gives the false hope that you'll be able to do the right thing. And one day you'll be good enough or small enough or quiet enough, or you won't need meds or you won't need food, you won't need something enough that will mean that you don't have the bad thing happen to you now. But the other way to look at it is to acknowledge that actually people I trusted either did bad things to me or did not guard me enough and allowed other people to do bad things to me and ignored me when I told or when I showed signs of distress. And actually the world is full of terrifying and horrible things which make no sense and have no meaning and are not for any educational or holy or, or um, learning reason. They are just terrible, terrible things. And any learning we get from them as adults is up to us um, and is not in any way obligatory or even necessarily possible. And most children can't deal with that. But then most adults can't deal with that because who wants to think I'm struggling because huh, I live in a structurally inequitable system in which generations of people for eons have worked to oppress me. Nobody wants to think that generally, at least at the beginning, like that's a horrible, terrifying thought. It's much easier to think I just need a bit of a, a pull up and a bit of extra help and then I'll like what, be on the top of this pile? But like, you don't think like that because you know, you, you, you're in it. So firstly, uh, yeah, I, I, I would not, um, I would be working to deconstruct the idea of mandatory therapy because um, I think it sh people should have uh, agency as to when and how they start to unpick these things. I feel a bit like well-being gets really co-opted. A colleague of mine said like, described well-being as like neoliberalism's project of self-mastery. Like we're all supposed to be able to like master ourselves. But, and, and that's all our work. That's all the work that we're supposed to be doing so that we can survive in an oppressive system better and, and make more money for it and consume more shit. No, to me, 100%. I always think, look, where are they orienting the problem? Where is the, where is the problem being located? Is it being located in my body under the medical model that yeah. I am the problem? And so now it's my job to somehow overcome it or transmute it or do it, it like what's happening there? Was that, and who is that convenient for? Yeah. Who benefits? Who, who gains? Who gains? Yeah. Exactly. Who gains from me locating that problem in my disabled queer body? So, yeah. huh. Just always, always looking and absolutely like I have watched mindfulness be co-opted and, and weaponized against marginalized peoples because it, what do you mean You've, you're off work from stress? We paid for a half day mindfulness course for you and we gave you that app. So what, so what <laughs> that we doubled your workload and didn't give you any extra resource? I mean, you, you're failing at self-care. You must not yeah. be doing, so, you need to be better at self-care. No. What you need, we need better to do, boundaries. You... Better, you just need to do better. So, so actually what you need to do is not be living under an oppressive system. Perhaps mm. that would be helpful. So mm. and 
like and, and it is that 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 micro of you know is is it me is it the outside world you know where are the boundaries to that on a macro scale socially we can't acknowledge that you know grown-ups mummy and daddy the the institutions in some ways have actually are actually perpetrating harm so we all must just be doing it wrong mm. it doesn't make sense when children try and rationalize it that way and it doesn't make sense when adults rationalize it that way but the impetus and the pressure for us to believe that because then we just take it on and then every time like when i was first sick like you said you know exactly as you said when you stop trying to cure yourself and get better you can live well or much more much closer but my ability to take on that ex did i exempt the nhs did i exempt the doctors who were abusive because i took on the problem that i hadn't managed to fix myself yet sorry, i think about this a lot as you can tell sorry <laughs> i feel like i hit a jackpot <laughs> in a really <laughs> selfish way i asked the right people the right question because wow, just wow. Yeah, I haven't had that response to that question yet. Uh, and yeah, man, thank you guys so much. This is like one heck of a game. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, Raquel. Yeah. What category would you like? Okay, hit me with social. With social, um, community is now a thing of the past. The government, the government believes in the individual and the individual only. Community groups meet in secret. Book groups meet in the back of rooms in the back rooms of bars where tables for one are lit by candle. The only place you are allowed to socially engage is now online. What has become lost? What has become lost? You know, when you started reading that, Will, I was like, you, you said, oh, the government now only uh, what, uh, like values the individual. I'm like, that's where we are at now, you know? Um, so, Community being a thing of the past, what is lost? I mean, there's something to be gained, right? Chat to me. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to have to bring in my, uh, my good friends, Grace and Johnny, on this one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's something to be... If, if, if community can now only exist online or in very... Um, kind of uh, secretive spaces there is probably some I don't know I don't know I don't know how, how, to how would they even stop community because surely you can like so you can literally stop people meeting okay so and, and this is happening now you know we're stopping meeting yeah. groups for example but surely community exists in within us so I carry with me all of the people I love and my teachers and everything they taught me and community exists within me and it's something I'm part of. So I have like academic and activist ancestors and allies around me and people that I'm thinking of for the future that I hope are coming up behind me that I hope will have an easier time of it because of, you know that I'm contributing to something that's possible for them. So how could they, because community surely is not in the literal meeting of people but is much wider than that it's in the understanding it's in the emotional connections and the sharing of ideas and how practice intersects and how knowledge is transmitted what is community it's a better community now isn't that what we're doing we're creating community online um you know maybe our brain had to adapt the, the community now, and unfortunately, you know, um, I agree what Great was saying. You know, community is important to me. My deaf community is really important to me. Um, you know, I met dining with people and uh, with very tactile people, and that's why I said for a while I wouldn't go online because it didn't mean anything to me. You know, I want to 
uh, body language, facial expression, everything. But I think over time, my brain has started to probably morph in. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, and um, this is what the pandemic has done to it. And then we're learning how to talk to a screen without that kind of, uh, what's the word, untactile, unemotionate feeling. Um, but I believe, I really believe I find the community within the disabled, the disabled people because of that shared experience. Um, and, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. It, uh, it's, a, it's a scary thing. It's like sometimes we think about um, what we see, uh, what the word, mutant in the future, you know. Is that what become a vet? Are we mutant now? Uh, this is our community. Um, um, you know, unpredictable. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if that answered any question or I'm just going off track here. Well, <laughs> I think the <laughs> community online i think what what i when i was thinking oh that is there something to be gained there is there something to be gained about like uh, in in the furtiveness of it or in having such a clear kind of enemy or such a clear but but i really don't know mm. um, i think it would be interesting for it to be explicit because i think there is already just as we just as you said a cult of individualization this sense that actually um that uh such things are as an individual that it's your job to pull yourself up by your bootstraps it's your job to keep the stiff upper lip um and much and like when i used to have um press sometimes uh, especially at the beginning of my business i was first setting up my business um and i had a grant and they helped connect me to some press um and all they wanted to write was disabled woman sets up company success and I was like, right, I was like, okay, can you actually say, like, woman, we, pitches for and wins grant, uh, has supported family, works for a decade, mm -hmm. manages to make some money that is still below the poverty line, like that, that's about, but that's not an interesting story of supporting my work, and that I've supported their work, and that we, you know, we, we manage or we struggle and we, innovate together nobody's interested in that i would tell them everything like we, we were featured in the times for human boxes which was a big deal at the time because um you know we were um hoping people would would buy boxes um and we had these non-profit uh, gift boxes that we made for people in life crisis um that were all ethically made and designed by disabled people and everybody in the company was uh, disabled um or a carer and uh like I told them everybody who helped and, I, and I, I kind of you know did radical credit giving and they didn't publish any of that and just said it was all me so I mm. think we're all yeah. which is nonsense and of course it's impossible so I think we're already in this space so having that clear like clear ex made explicit what is already mm. implicit and visceral that mm. I think could absolutely be very very important I completely agree because mm. I this again this is a, a colleague of mine who said this he said that um like neoliberalism has kind of all got us working away on our own brands rather than coming together for the kind of civic civic duty that like maybe our parents or grandparents did that they'd go to the union meeting or they'd go to those spaces where like collectively you have power but we don't have those collective spaces of power so we're all just trying to build a website or build a fucking instagram account or like social media and it's it's bullshit it's like it's like the neoliberalism well of well-being thing it's just like keeping us focused where the where the problem isn't yeah. and where the change it's isn't going to come yeah wow yeah. wow mad got a bit dark no i don't think i don't think it got dark i, I like i genuinely think it's it naturally like the entry points into some of these like spaces of thinking like require us to face some stuff and like jump over the other side of the fence and be like oh crap i have no idea what it looks like around here i don't know what means what um and that's why i love this space because it's because there's 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 no stakes, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like, uh, do you know what, today I'm, I'm going to make that word mean this instead of what it's always meant type of 
type of thing, you know? Mm. So, yeah, like, looking at community explicitly and and how it's manifesting and how it's, as Johnny put, like, ev- evolving, kind of like our idea of community is a mutation of what it was a mere 20 years ago. Uh, I mean, let alone what it was, like, nine months ago right now. Do you know what I mean? So, and and... I love it. I'm such a sucker for superhero references. So when he said mutants, I was like, yeah, X-Men. <laughs> <laughs> like, totally. And yeah. I, I completely, I started reading, I was looking for stories which had disabled people in them without it being like, oh, they're disabled. Like without that being the crisis. Like I wanted a story about like a, a bank heist you know, with like a love, tri- like a poly love triangle in it that happened that had disabled people in it. Like that was the kind of, like I wanted the, the, something else to kind of be the thing in it. Um, could not find that story. If you know it, please contact me. Um, so I was Googling a, 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 many years ago now and I eventually came across um, X-Men fan fiction. Had never seen X-Men, never read the comics, but was like, this seems interesting. And oh, the way, some, the way some of it was written seems to have such parallels to the process that Raquel so described about acquired disability, about caring, about discrimination. And I'm just like, yeah, so I am. And I have actually been reading a lot of fan fiction during lockdown, um, <laughs> coming back to some classics. So yeah, if you want Rex, I'm there. <laughs> um, I, 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 at this point, I, I really want to thank all of you like so much for really leaning into this space man and just being dope just just so fucking dope um i'm like overwhelmed right now because of how much we've been looking forward to this like joe and i've been speaking about it so much and and completely blown me out of the water man thank you guys so much for joining us on this the final episode of the residence Come on. <laughs> Final episode of the Resident Series One, mind you. Let's let's be hopeful about how we do how we do our work. Um and yeah, man, like like check check out everyone's work, man. Grace's work, Johnny's work, Raquel's work. And I know, I know that there's PM Studio Talks as well on the YouTube channel as well. And there's so many links to get access to the type of work that these three incredible people are doing and the thinking behind the work that they're doing as well um i'm just yeah ever so grateful um and yeah i mean like peace out for now and fingers crossed god willing you guys will hear from us again and there it goes the last episode of this series of the residents I've been your host, Will Taylor, and I want to say thanks to Johnny Cotson, Raquel Messegur, and Grace Quantock for their generosity in that conversation. If you couldn't tell, I had my mind blown a few times. I also want to take this opportunity to give a massive shout out to the guests who appeared on the previous episodes too. Big love. Thanks to The Watershed, the University of Bristol, and UE Bristol for supporting the project. Hold tight, Joe Kimbar for pulling the strings and Javier Velastin for supplying the sounds. And shouts to the team at the Pervasive Media Studio too, Luke Emery, Joe Lansdowne and Beryl Jamba. To those who have listened and those who are yet to, we appreciate you all. Check us out on Twitter and Instagram. Just type in Pervasive Media Studio and we will come up straight away. You can find all of our episodes on all streaming platforms, including YouTube. So like, subscribe and share with anyone that you can. And rate us highly. We promise you will be back with more. Until then, love. <laughs>